Hi, I'm Greg. I'm the lead singer from Lipstick Generation. And I'm Steve. I'm the bassist. And welcome to the Lifted panel. Today on the Lifted panel, we are talking about a Smashing Pumpkins album, and I started this episode because Steve is bad at introducing the show. What album are we talking about? We're talking about Tear Garden by Kaleidoscope, uh, sort of an album, a uh, collection of songs, MP3s, EPs, just a, a really weird, gigantic, massive musical undertaking that Billy Corgan undertook. And, um... We had some really great guests scheduled to appear on this episode, but none of them showed up, so we have Victor instead. Victor, welcome back to the show. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> he showed up. But you know what? Victor is the MVP of the show. Like, people, you know, they come for Greg and Steve, but they stay for Victor Krause. Like, that's what, that's what the people <laughs> right? are here for. <laughs> and honestly, it's very on brand for uh, this particular album that a bunch of people were like, oh, yeah, shoot, that sounds really cool. And... Like, the people organizing it were all excited, and there was this whole plan, and then just, like, over the course of time, it sort of tapered off and was like, you know what? Nah. Never mind. I don't, on second thought, want to do a 50-month, 50-song cycle about the tarot, and it turns out some of those songs that I originally wrote might not have been very good anyway. So, let's just bundle up a couple of them into a couple of EPs, and then go record a new album. All right, so typically uh, we begin, you know, begin our episodes going around the panel, talking about our histories with the subject matter, which would be the band and the album. Uh, Steve, do you want to just keep going and riffing on this? Sure. I was actually on the Smashing Pumpkin the mailing list during this project. I was, uh, I was following it pretty keenly because, you know, I had realized that I wasn't having a great time with Zeitgeist by this time point. But I still really liked this band and was intrigued to see what else they were going to come up with. So I joined the mailing list and I promptly downloaded all the MP3s as they came by. And then I occasionally deleted them as I was like, hold on, this is just a bad remix of Hummer. Why did they send this out? Also, they took out all the lyrics. What is even the point? All right, next song. But um, there were a couple of really standout tracks that I really enjoyed during the project. Um, I tend to also be the sort of person who... If I'm going to buy an album, I want to get my money's worth. And so when they released the EPs of these, I was like, wait, so I'd be spending 15 bucks for a single song? No thanks. I've got the rest of them already. So I, I didn't listen to the, the ones that were EP exclusive until we started prepping for this. And Victor, how about you? What's your experience with The Pumpkins and Tear Garden by Kaleidoscope? Not Tea Garden, but Tear Garden, as is the proper spelling. I know we've been calling it Tea Garden for a while, but it's Tear Garden. <laughs> we've been calling it Tea Garden for over a decade. Um, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, I was a, a member of the Sleepy Corgan Choir from uh, 2005 to 2010. So I was initially slated to sort of be a part of this project, but was frozen out and was a member in name only, which is why I just learned all of that information that you were talking about just now. Uh, I Yeah, I didn't know that that's what was happening here. I had heard rumblings that this was not an album that was completed. And I wasn't sure exactly, other than I was kind of like, these songs are feel like mostly done, but I feel like there's a level of polish I kind of expect that I'm not getting here. Um, and also, from an album standpoint, it definitely, although it's long enough to be an album, doesn't feel quite done when it's at the end. So, okay, this all makes a lot more sense to me now. Um, and my history with it is... Um, I listened to it a couple of times and I was like, this is weird. And then I listened to it a couple more times and I was like, this is good. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll go ahead and go next. So I uh, grew up in the nineties and thought the smashing pumpkins were just another boring alternative rock band and had no interest in them. And Wait, then, do you think anyone's actually coming in specifically on tear garden as their first episode? Some people <laughs> might be, uh, <laughs> Welcome, weirdos. And welcome, weirdos. You know, they might be like, I'm just going to check out the newest episode first. Some people do that. Some people are weird, psychotic freaks. Um, Come for the great. Stay for the abuse from Steve. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was not a fan of the Pumpkins and gradually learned that they had a bunch of different layers to them that were very um, different than Bullet than Bullet with Butterfly Wings. And this album is a continuation of a bunch of those layers. Um 
I, I think this is a, a great collection of songs. I mean, I, I understand the idea was to, you know, to go through the entire, uh, what, tarot card deck and write songs about each of the cards or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, do it through different, like and do it through different EPs. So, I mean, he wrote them. He right. wrote all the songs. He just didn't release most of them. Didn't release most of them, but the idea was, okay, so you have Oceania and Monuments to an Elegy both became their own albums later on as part of this project. And so for the sake of this, we just combined the first two EPs, um, which were you know released as standalone MP3s and then later released as uh, vinyl EPs with one bonus song on each. And... You know, the idea was, uh, you know, if you look at the time frame, they were trying to figure out how to best market music in a new digital landscape where, you know, CD sales had gone down. And they're like, is the individual one song at a time format going to be better for us than uh, releasing entire albums? Like they were, you know, they were trying to innovate, trying to figure out a new way to distribute music, which... I think, honestly, a lot of people are still figuring that out as, you know, the market is constantly shifting with, you know, Spotify having more and more of the market share and, you know, CDs and vinyl being largely dead aside from hardcore collectors. I think people are still trying to figure out the economics of music. And so this uh, album was, you know, another experiment uh, towards trying to figure that out. But I think musically, I think this is really strong. I think the songs on here are great. Um a lot of them have more of a classic rock vibe than a lot of the Pumpkins catalog. But as a guy who likes classic rock quite a bit, I'm just like, oh, shoot, this sounds like the kind of music that I like. This is pretty cool. Um, but I, I think the songs are great. I think lyrically they're actually really clever. And I think this is actually a really um, underrated release. And I'm so glad that Craig Smith um, helped us get access to some of the songs that we were missing. You know, you could actually argue that uh, they, the band was really ahead of their times with marketing this album in that since they were distributing it via their email list and website for free, uh, they were releasing digital-only versions of it and not actually making any money, just like the rest of the market went over the next decade. <laughs> yeah. The rest of us are releasing digital-only versions of our songs and not making any money on them. Pretty much. Hell yeah. But I, I, re I really was uh, sincerely impressed with these songs where I – this album sort of has, you know, from a lot of Pumpkins fans who have been on the show, like a bad reputation and people joke and make fun of it as just being a bunch of trash. And I think this is just a bunch of really s strong songs. So I was very impressed wa with it and expected it to be terrible because everyone rags on it. I think this is really good. And um, yeah, I, I sincerely loved this release. I think it's quite excellent. I, I would mostly agree. I think it's almost entirely good songs. I think there's a couple that I would that I don't care for, but I don't know if there's any songs on here that are truly bad. Yeah, I would agree. So you guys ready to get into this ranking? I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, coming at the bottom of ranking, we've got B Nips. That's right. Yep. The, this is uh, uh, this we, album is so good. B Nips does not does not eclipse anything. Yep, uh, we've talked about Billy Corgan's nipples on other episodes, Nightmare Pellets, no one likes them. Any comments on B-Nips before we move on? I feel like we're sort of past the B-Nips. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, without Gavin here, uh, there's not much point to talk about B-Nips. Unless somebody's writing some nips. sweet fan fiction about, him, about them, nah. Alright, so coming in as the least best song on Tear Garden by Kaleidoscope, we've got Cottonwood Symphony, which I did not rank at the bottom. And neither did I. Oh, which means I probably did. I don't know, let me check the rankings. Where did I put it? You ranked it at the bottom. Oh, well, <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, uh... Um, sort, of, sort of a non-song. I feel like it's a song. It has, uh... It has lyric and melody and a chord progression. I feel like that is the definition of a song, sir. <laughs> oh, no, right. It's not actually a symphony. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I remember this one. So this is one of the ones that I wasn't as familiar with because, you know, uh, Billy didn't release it for free, so I didn't care. Um, wow, spoken like a true millennial music listener. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, but... The song itself is okay, but it really like shows Billy Corgan's limits as a vocalist. Like when he's doing the soft voice thing, 
and he pushes the limits of his vocal range, it just doesn't sound good. It just sounds weak. I mean, it sounds like an alternative rock vocalist, which, you know, typically is weak. He sounds sounds weak. I want him to sound fucking alpha. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Get some gains, bro. (laughs) I, uh... I ranked this the highest of the bunch. I gave this six points out of a possible 12. I think this is a great song where the first time I heard it, uh, I will admit the vocals um, kept me a little bit away from it. But I think it's more because I wasn't used to hearing this kind of a vocal from Billy. I think this is different than anything he's ever done. But I think uh, after, you know, I went back and revisited each song a couple times, as is my want to do, where I don't judge it from just a first listen. I give it a couple times to sit with it. Um, hey, this wasn't a Kiss album. I listened to every song multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, I, anyway, I probably listened to this one more than you did, uh, I would suspect. Uh, Possibly. I think this is a really great song. I really love the... Uh, you know, the chord progression underneath and the way that the instrument sounded. Just, I love the production of this one. And I think Billy does deliver a good vocal that's just very different than what he's done before. And I think it's not meant to be, um, it's meant to be kind of a soft, pretty song. And I think he delivers a great vocal on this. I think it's just, it's very different. And I think it's jarring how different it is from the rest of the catalog. But, you know, once you get to like the third or fourth listen, it's like, wow, this is a really great song. And I find myself in the mood to listen to it in isolation where I just want to pull up this song in particular. I think it's great. Uh, Victor, you ranked it in between us. You gave it four points. What's your thoughts on this one? So this is um, uh, another thing I forgot to mention. When I first started listening to this album, I didn't download all of the songs somehow. Actually, I think what happened was I did download all of them, but then I moved it into iTunes before they had all downloaded. So this... For the first two or three times I listened to the album, this was the last track. And I thought it was a really good closer. (laughs) Uh, I don't know if I truly love it as like a fantastic composition, but I think it would have worked really well as the last song. Um, I just think it's maybe not quite as good as a couple other songs that um, I have mentioned him maybe working in a similar mode, although not like totally doing the same thing with the hushed vocals would be like Zeitgeist from Zeitgeist and then um, Sunkissed, I feel like are kind of similar-ish, although Sunkissed is a little more um, uh, fully arranged. But those are... I, I don't like that song nearly as much as either of these. Or reverse. This song, not as good as those. But I think if that were the last song here, it would have worked really well as that. Um And it's kind of like I would never cut it from this album. It's not it's obviously it's above B nips, but I I I do like this one. It's just not totally the thing. The weird thing I found is that like a Billy for this album sold all of the um, all of the reverb phaser or like plugins and pedals he bought from uh, what was the last one we did? from uh, Future Embrace, and he bought a couple of phasers. And then this song even has phaser on it, which is very funny. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, yeah, I think this song is fine and would have worked really well as the last track, which is what I thought it was for several listens. And it was the last track for one of the EPs. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, Yeah, I I think it's fine. This is one of the ones that I'm not as totally in love with but as we climb even one or two spots above i'm gonna start really loving the songs from this album well hey uh next up is a song that i gave one point less to and that victor ranked at the very bottom we've got (laughs) widow wake my mind next on the list (laughs) so i think this is a good song but it just it's like a minute too long it, it just, it goes on a little bit too long, overstays its welcome, where, you know, it's catchy, it's got good hooks, but it's just, it's a little bit too repetitive, and I think that's just sort of the only ding against it, where if you just made this a minute shorter, uh, it might, it might rank much higher on the list. I think it's a really great song that just, you know, could have used some uh, fat trimmed off of it. I'm going to guess that we have disagreements as to what the fat that needs to be trimmed on this album, on this song is. 
in that I don't really go in for the O's on, on this one. I find those a little bit like grating. I don't like uh, them either. <laughs> yeah, like like that, when I think of this song, that's the first thing I think of is the L L L, probably because that's what the song starts with. And I'm like, oh yeah, that bit. But then when I actually listen to it, I'm like, oh yeah, there's a lot of other like really solid hooks on this that I enjoy listening to. I mean, like I, the the weird fuzzy um, like synthesizer that underlies the the uh, vocal melody on the one verse is pretty cool. Just the vocal melody itself is solid. I like the O's and I like the vocal melodies. I just think it's just you know you have too many choruses. You should just like cut it and trim it. It's just like too much a uh, too much verse chorus, and I think it's just it's a little bit too much for this piece for how long it is. Mm. Yeah, I think this is one where melodically it just doesn't engage me at all. Uh, I I really I don't like the chorus of this song very much. I don't think it's a total loss, but I yeah, this one just doesn't do a lot for me. It's super great uh, to jog to though. Okay, I can see that. Okay. I, I like some of the, like kind of the weird. I mean, it's not that weird, but. It's just a little off kilter kind of timing things he does in the OO part where it's just like the measures are oh. weirdly done. Um, I don't it's just, it. And I haven't gotten to that episode of the Discographers podcast yet. <laughs> you know, the objectively uh, superior version of what we did. <laughs> that's, that's not quite true. Their objectively superior parts are the parts that I listen to. And then when they do the part where it's just what we do, I, I skip those parts. <laughs> he said, well, this is bullshit. I could do that. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know, sitting down and doing a deep dive of the music theory behind the entire construction of an album, plus like a really thorough analysis of the, you know, historical context of what the band was up to when the album was done. That's difficult. Talking bullshit about what your favorite song is. Psh, anybody can do that. I mean, you know, the <laughs> idea is that we're trying to at least on my end, I'm trying to articulate the thought process of the band and also comment on what my thoughts on the songwriting are without getting too bogged down, just like, and here's this key change here, like, you know, a middle ground. You are able to do a middle ground, dude. Maybe you are. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> this is one, I also, I'm looking at my notes again here. This is one I specifically called out as being, I do not like the drums in this song at all, especially in the chorus. It just they just feel a little I mean they're probably well played and purposefully the way that they are, but I just don't like how it sounds. Like the way that Hit they're the drums, Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy. Like it's it's almost too complicated for what is happening. And then this is another song where he says heart and I thought it was house again. <laughs> you crawl, you By the way, into Jimmy my isn't house. playing the drums, it's Mike Byrne on this album. I know. That's why I said it. It's funny. Ah, maybe if, it. maybe if Jimmy had hit the drums instead. You know what? There's that is often of... the consensus on these things. <laughs> uh, you I know mean, what? Jimmy. I didn't. I didn't miss Jimmy on this. I'm going to be completely honest. Like, I think the drumming is very excellent, and I feel like it's like the Kiss fans are just like, "What if it's not the original four? It sucks." And it's like, <laughs> bro. The original four wasn't on Crazy Crazy Nights, and that's like one of the best songs. So just like get over the original four. True. But yeah, uh, Widow Wake My Mind. It sure is a song. Next up sure on the list is, is another song. I rank this much <laughs> higher than the other panelists because this song has some Greg energy to it. We've got Owada next on the list. Uh, <laughs> I literally can never remember how this song goes. I'm like, is that the one that goes, Owada? No, no, it's the one that just like <laughs> steals that line and then is more forgettable about it. I think I think it's very catchy. Um, personally, I think this is one of the catchier songs in them. I love the instrumentation on this. Um, you know, I love the keyboards throughout. I think they're really, really great. It just this makes me smile. It's just a really excellent feel good song. Like, I, and you know, one of the reasons I insist on you know doing the bonus tracks and whatnot on this was because I just loved this one so much. Like, this is. It makes me smile. It puts me in a good mood. It's super catchy and would go on a pumpkin's playlist for me. It's a playlist. I love this one. I think this oh, sorry, one's go ahead. fine. I again, this one suffers from sequencing. I do not like this as the last track, um, which is what it ended up being. Which is just like, I mean, 
it's stupid because this isn't an, an album that's done but just the order of the songs that i got this was the last one and i don't like it there um this one uh the bass is fun and the sound design is good and then once i figured out what the title was referring to i thought it was funny yeah that's pretty great <laughs> um and uh yeah i just I think it suffers from being the last song. I also don't like hearing the word California in songs. I'm, I'm California. California girl, get in my truck. We're going to celebrate I don't, like, tomorrow forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit done with California. Chicago is allowed. He <laughs> says that right after. Um, I also made a note, a point of noting that the bridge of this song is very lame. My big take with my big takeaway from the song is it just feels like a Zwan outtake to me. I mean, I like the Zwan album; it was pretty great. So, and I yeah. think this is better produced than anything on the Zwan album. I mean, they did release this one as a single, so I could see that as a like, you know, being an intentional thing. One of the ideas that he said with this project was that he was going to release songs one at a time and really take his time to get each song where it's supposed to be. So instead of rushing things along on an album cycle, it was, you know, a month or so, however long it took to record the song up to his own, you know, preferences. So theoretically, he had plenty of time to get every song where he wanted it to be on this album. But if you listen to it in chronological order, you can hear a little bit of him finding his legs by the third or fourth song. I mean, that's fair, fair but, but I, I, once again, I think this is a very strong song. I, I think it's great, and once again, love that title. <laughs> it's pretty clever. I, yeah, I think this song is fine. I don't love this mode of his lyric writing, um, but I think the song is overall fine. And, you know, when I have a talk with him about how this album should actually be done, I'm just going to make sure it's not the last song. My friend Billy. Right, your Sorry. good friend Billy. I like how he's, you know, gradually upgrading to your friend and yeah. not just the guy who hired you to be in his choir. Right. Well, you know, relationships develop over time, Steve. Yeah, over the course of a couple of months after five years of professional work. <laughs> or I guess it, I'm not in the choir anymore. I worked with him professionally for five years and have since developed a friendship. Got to get my, uh, got to get my lore correct. Your lore? Billy Lorgan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start referencing Victor Lore on Billy Corgan's Instagram and see how long before I get banned. <laughs> instantly. Mm. Yeah, pro probably pretty instantly. I mean, I might be able to survive on his Instagram. Like, hey, Billy, I actually like Tear Garden a lot. I think it's great, and I'd like to ask you some questions about the songwriting and composition. Uh, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> maybe. Or he might say something snarky about, oh, now people want to listen to Tear Garden. Yeah. Well, you got to say, Billy, your, oh, sorry, your I had good to... albums... Belly, I, your good albums are bad, and your bad albums are good. I need to say William. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. So anyway, next oh, about... He, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just asking, has he rebranded? He's William Corgan. William oh, he, had a whole, Corgan. he had a whole thing about this. Like, at his birthday show four or five years back, the crowd was where chanting he played, Billy, Where he played Billy, Bad for Billy. Good. Yeah, yeah the, that was a great show. The crowd was chanting Billy, and he was like... Thanks, but I'm William now. I'm an adult. Billy is a child's name. So the crowd started chanting William. <laughs> I don't see what you're laughing about. This is a perfectly normal exchange between a crowd of people and a musician that they like. <laughs> you're right. It's not funny. <laughs> 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 now that you put it like that, <laughs> I'm not laughing. I'm mad, actually. <laughs> how, how dare they call him by the wrong name like that? That was so rude. Speaking of things <laughs> to make Victor mad, that's up on the list. We have Spangled, fourth from the bottom. Oh, that's no good. Oh, hey, is that exactly where I put it? No, I put it fifth. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, this is... Um... This is probably my bad. I'm the one who tanked this. I only gave this two points. Um, I I really love the lyrics to this piece, but I think uh, musically, even though it's in a style of Billy Corgan's writing that I like quite a bit, I just think it's just not as catchy. 
So because it wasn't as catchy of a pop song, uh, you know, second from the bottom, even though I still think it's good, I don't think it's bad. It's just I've heard him do the same kind of thing with a better melody. Lyrically, I think this is one of his, maybe one of his best pieces, but um, like melodic wise, it's just a little bit weaker for me. Uh, my problem with this one, I ranked it, you know, low mid ultimately. It's a decent song, but it's suffering from weak voice Billy syndrome. You mean like the entire catalog? Oh no! Oh no! But there are um, times when, like, he's Steve, singing. Yeah, Steve, it's weak voiced William. <laughs> Got him. Weak voiced <laughs> William sounds like an old timey uh, form of ED. <laughs> like you'd hear it in an Irish ballad. <laughs> Like, oh, I went to the pub tonight and had too much whiskey. Came home and met a weak-voiced William. <laughs> so true. But yeah, I so Spangled. Him. I like that I just sort of de derailed us and all of us are like, man, I would so much rather be listening to dirty Irish ballads right now. <laughs> but yeah, Steve, you were saying about Spangled before you derailed yourself. Right. I, I mean, weak-voiced William syndrome. Otherwise, otherwise, it's a it's a fine song. It's um, you know, you know my my general take on ballads. Uh, this isn't the strongest Pumpkins ballad, uh, but it's not like bad for it either. And uh, Victor, I know this song um has so much Victor energy, so I'll let you go. What's your thoughts on this one? Well, it's my energy. my notes are very my notes are very succinct. I guess fake, har fake harpsichord is just Final Fantasy VIII to me. Baby's first Radiohead. Do not talk about how you loved my body. <laughs> <laughs> if he had not done that, it might have been higher. <laughs> but yeah, this one, I yeah, I enjoy this one. It's not, it's not a mind blower melodically, but I think it is. Uh, uh, well constructed, and I would agree that the lyrics are good, and I did hear them. Well, you heard the lyrics on this one. I honestly, on this album, I heard a lot more lyrics than I usually do. Interesting. That's just how good Billy is as a singer. He just grabs your attention with the lyrics. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, deep, deep. Damn, I didn't think about it that. <laughs> Speaking of great Billy Corgan lyrics, Nest Up is Tear Garden theme. Yeah! <laughs> That's the one I was thinking on Cottonwood Symphony. Yeah, <laughs> see, the joke is that it's an instrumental. So when I say great Billy Corgan lyrics, there aren't any. That's the mm -hmm. joke. Jokes. Jokes? Wait, where bottom. did we rank Widow Wake My Mind? Uh, second from the bottom. Second to last. Wait, how did the shitty reprise of Widow Make the My, my Mind beat the original song? Uh, because you don't have to hear him say stupid shit. You just hear a <laughs> an instrument play it. <laughs> yeah, Victor gave this nine points. I gave it four <laughs> points. So I ranked it one below Widow Wake My Mind. Um, where, honestly, if I had to choose between the two of them, I might choose this one. Um, you know, like Based upon my current mood. Like... I think Widow Wake My Mind is a better song, but I'd rather listen to Tear Garden theme because I really like the instrumentation. And I, I like it as a nice change of pace from the rest of the album. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, I, I would agree there. I also like kind of the design. This is another one. This is a lost FF8 track because of the harpsichord. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a gone Not in the intentional drop. Accidental <laughs> rim shots. I just dropped a mic cable on a cymbal. <laughs> um, this I was listening to it uh, more carefully at one point, and I noticed the harpsichord also has a little synth behind it that has like a little portamento thing on it, so the notes bend into each other, which I thought was very fun. Um, and this also has a um, uh, get get ready for this, folks. Billy Corgan. More like Billy Carpsichord. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but then in the back half, it's Billy Org Billy Corgan again. <laughs> Due to the organ. Yeah, this one. This Billy's one. Uh, yeah. 
Oh, no. Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> I Yeah, I think this is a pleasant album change up and it's, I think, decently far enough into the album that an album change up uh, works. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a good reprise. I think it brings things together. Um, you know, as a fellow fan of JRPG music, harpsichords and, you know, leitmotif uh, work for me. Uh, so that's why, you know, the two guys who like JRPGs are very favorable towards this one. And the one guy who's like, JRPGs suck. Um, it puts it second from the bottom. <laughs> I like that, uh, like, we're unable to get Victor out of the mode of thinking of this as an album despite the fact that it was very pointedly not an album project. But I only found out about that today. That's fair. <laughs> and I mean, I still think of this as an album. When I'm thinking about the Pumpkins catalog, I think that these first two Tear Garden EPs work together as an album, and then you've got Oceania and Monuments as separate albums in that Tear Garden project, but it's like part one of the trilogy, part two, part three is how I uh, interpret them. So a trilogy mm. of albums like Bad Out of Hell 1, 2, and 3, like they work together as pieces, and I feel like because it'd be, if you did it as, you know, the two EPs, and then you did Oceania and Monuments, those are four parts, and because the first two parts are so short and work together well, why not just make them, you know, one album, and then add in the two bonus tracks. And Wikipedia puts them all under this one article. So you know what? That's what I'm going to say. Tear Garden is this album as we decided it. <laughs> Fake Tear Garden. Hashtag I like the idea of, of like comparing it as a trilogy to the Bad Out of Hell trilogy, which wasn't so much a trilogy as it was just like, you know, Steinman and Meatloaf wanted to keep making the same amount of money they made off the first one, so they kept on doing similar projects again. Except the, the third one where a Meatloaf was like, I'd like to keep making money, and Jim was like, but I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, speaking of things that underwhelm, uh, next up on the list, you know what? Bad Out of Hell 3 was fine. Uh, next up on the list, we have the song I ranked at the very bottom. We've got Lightning Strikes. Oh, that's one of the few new ones that I was like, oh, this is good. It had a little bit of a weak Billy voice, but uh, it was like a really well-structured song, had some good hooks on it. I ranked it, yeah, like fourth. Yeah, I thought this was um, the least original song on the album, where it's just like, oh, it's like sort of a, a standard pumpkin song, but without uh, as good of hooks as most standard pumpkin songs. And also, I'm probably... Uh, comparing it unfavorably to the 60s pop song Lightning Strikes by Lou Christie uh, with that kick-ass amazing falsetto. Um, so this song, it's I mean, it's not bad, but it's just, um, it feels like almost generic pumpkins. And there's better examples of generic pumpkins I feel on the same release. Um, so it's just like it, for me, this is the least essential of all the tracks. Uh, I don't know if I would go quite that far. I would agree that it's a little generic. Um, and I think kind of the transitions between the sections are a little awkward, but I like pretty much all the individual sections. Um, and this is an, this is one of the ones, the other one that I did not know was on the album the first couple of times I listened to it due to being a genius, computer genius. Mm. And... Um, this one, with subsequent listens, eventually moved up higher and higher. But in my notes, I never said why. <laughs> so I would assume <laughs> it's because I like the individual. I liked the individual sections, but don't like how they go from one to the other. And the song I ranked right below it is it has not come up yet, but I'm not upset. Like the the one I have right below it, I think is just as good, if not maybe a little better uh, example of kind of a similar mode. Um, and then there's one that I have much higher that I think is just a much better example of this. But this song is fine. Yeah, I, I think I really agree with your assessments. Maybe good components not necessarily adding up to a good finished piece. Where it's like, I, in isolation, I'm like, yeah, this section is fine, but they're just not gelling together in a way where it's a song I want to go back and revisit. Where... 
Like, I remember the vibe of this song, but I don't remember the hooks of this song, and to me, that's a bit of an issue. Anyway. Anyway, next up on the list, we have Freak USA. Uh, Steve and I put this in the exact same spot. We both gave it eight points. Uh, and then and I tanked it. <laughs> you t- yeah, you tanked it. Uh, so here is my, I would say, probably my hottest take in the entire Pumpkins discography. Better than Geek USA. Uh, mm-hmm. I think this is a, a catchier, uh, better constructed song, better lyrics. This is actually, I feel, vague angst done right. Um, like I actually think the, the lyrics to this are brilliant, and I'm generally not into vague angst. But this is vague angst where you can still tell like slightly where that angst is directed. And that tiny bit of direction in the angst makes the vague angst work for me. I think this is just... Um, a really great song. It has great production, great fuzzy guitars. So it does have that sort of, you know, Siamese dream era pumpkin sound, uh, but with the vocals more upfront in the mix and with, I think, better hooks. Um, so not that Geek USA is a bad song, but I think this is a better one. Uh, and I know there were some people in the chat who aren't with us who were talking trash about this in comparison to Geek USA. I think this is actually a little bit better. I think this is a really cool song and I like it a lot. I like the idea that, you know, what, by this point, 40, 35, 40-year-old Billy Corgan is better at vague angst than teenage Billy Corgan? <laughs> I mean, he, he just is. He just wrote a better song. Sorry. He <laughs> just figured out how to make that work. You know, it took him long enough. <laughs> he had to really hone his craft. Yeah, but, you know, finally at this point in the Pumpkins crew, they figured out how to make angst sound good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh. My my take on this one was like it sounds a lot like a Machina Two ripoff or uh, Machina Two reject, sorry, uh, which is you know a, um, a little bit more emphasis on vocals than it should really have, but like, not as bad as it has been historically. I like the fuzzy guitar. I like the energy. This is one of the few weird cases where the sleepy Corgan choir actually works for me. Like just the la la la's is uh, like yeah that's a that is an appropriate thing for this song to be doing right now. There's the, there's still some spots where the vocals are you know too far forward and too too weak. The life is not a dream when you can't wake up from the dream you wanted is a b- bad lyric. Uh, Greg, I don't know where you got vague angst done right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the line? The life is not a dream when you can't wake up from the dream you wanted. Um, I have to look at the lyrics for this again. I haven't looked at it in a in a couple weeks, but I remember this one sort of being like vague angst about just like uh, American society and sort of the the issues with it, as opposed to vague angst. Just like I'm a teenager and I'm bored. Um, I don't find that to be compelling. Vague angst because if you're bored, just like I don't know, find something to do. Especially if you live in Chicago. But right, that but sort the, of lyric. The, but the vague angst. Uh, you know, what? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up. So yeah, that lyric is literally the only thing I remember. Yeah. like from that lyric like, has uh, the the energy of that kid from the meme. The has anyone ever really had a dream to think that the dream to you could? Uh, it's it's a vocal like or it's a lyrical loop that kind of reminds me of um, in this ever in this ever changing world in which we live in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, no, hold on. I'm, I'm looking at this now. Okay, so the idea that life is not a dream when you can't wake up from the dream you wanted, I mean, the idea is that, you know, the, the sort of the lie of the American dream, you know, if you're not – look at the rest of this. You know, they poison our sweet mother earth, destroy our sacred bodies to fill our mouths with junk, and they call this knowledge. Like, these are all things about just like you no, know, the lies Greg, that corporatism I, in America has brought. Like, I think this is actually really genius, these lyrics. Greg, I said this song was about FF7 too, man. Like, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Greg, as, as somebody who spent my formative years thinking that Smashing Pumpkins lyrics had, like, some really clever turns of phrase and deep meaning, uh, I think you just like this lyric because it goes with a vocal hook that you think is good. I mean, it does go with a vocal hook, I think, is good, but I think these lyrics are actually good. Like, scars and bars and 51 stars, like, that's, oh, pretty please, I'm begging for freedom. There's lives to be blinded. I, like, 
I'm sorry, these are actually good lyrics, and I remember writing a note that, like, these lyrics are good for a pumpkin song. <laughs> but it's an <laughs> angst song, specifically. Because, like, it, this actually has a message, especially following the zeitgeist, which is like, hey guys, fascism is bad, and it's probably gonna ruin the country. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the, the lyrics for this are, are great. Um, respectfully disagree. Mm. Disrespectfully disagree. Boo! Ooh. Boo! <laughs> uh, so I love the guitar tone. The guitar tone here, but like once the actual rest of the song comes in, I'm kind of not that wild about it. I like the melody doesn't grab me as much as it clearly grabs Greg. Um, but. If you sped it up another 10 or 20 beats per minute and made it like a Sonic Adventure 2 song, <laughs> then then we'd be having a very different conversation. So really just Crash 40 needs to cover this song. Yes. You need to call up the Gioli brothers and be like, hey guys, get the band back together for this. <laughs> Sonata Arctica covering every song by the Pumpkins. <laughs> well, yeah, any other comments on Freak USA before we move on? That's all I got. I always forget that it's called Freak USA and just call it Freak. No, that's a Kiss song, dude. That's also a live song. I think a lot of people have written songs called Freak or Freaks or whatever. Like, most one-word titles are probably taken. That's probably true. I want to hear the song just called Razzmatazz. song's probably great. <laughs> probably is. Anyway, next up on the list is Tom Tom. Oh, this one's great. I like this one. This one's pretty good, but it does have a little bit of the vibe of just like white person being really into Native American culture vibe. <laughs> That's true enough. And that just makes <laughs> it slightly awkward where I'm like, this is a good song. But be careful, white boy. <laughs> so <laughs> careful, there are certain drums you're not allowed to use. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, the the intent is very good. The lyrics are good. I think um, the hooks are good. Um, like, I ranked it third from the bottom, but I think it's still a very good song. It's just, I'm just like, careful, white boy. <laughs> and that's really all I have to say about it. <laughs> so what gives you that vibe other than it being called Tom Tom? All right, well, let me pull up the lyrics here. Yeah, I kind of remember. I'm, try I'm trying to think of things to give that idea because, let's be honest, white people have used toms forever. Um, With my also, ancestors' drums, here comes the morning man. Oh. Right. Okay, I don't you know. know the I would, lyrics to the song, Steve, is what gave I me that vibe. I don't remember the lyrics to the song. Well, I don't know. Like, it's got an it's Irish enough not melody. Doing that. It's got an Irish enough melody that I would assume that he's talking about, you know, his also similarly pasty ancestors <laughs> who, you know, played fifes and drums. Those that wish secrets stay secret for morning mass. I tell myself it's where I belong among the waves and the dead and gone with my ancestors drums. Here comes the morning man. He's going to tell you where you stand. Going to try to undertake what's fallen. He's calling you. Here comes the morning man. Honestly, he was looking at a tarot deck when he wrote this. This is probably about just some, like, Irish skeleton running away from the English. Probably, <laughs> but, you know. Uh, also, he here comes the morning man. What is this, a Jim Steinman song? <laughs> is that boner joke? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so, my hot take on this song is, uh, I had to write it down because I'm very clever. Uh this is probably the strongest song uh, in terms of vocal pop hooks. Uh, but but here's the clever thing that Billy did uh, is he mixed his vocals to an appropriate level to the rest of the song rather than putting them all the way up front where you'd expect him to have put them. Really, really good move on his part. Um, look, I think that um, the vocals are mixed well consistently on this entire album. So I think the vocals are mixed well on this piece in particular and i could see this one doing well as a as a pop single the kind of song where like you know when they have those movie trailers and everything's dramatic and then they have like <laughs> the kind of shitty inspirational pop song at the end of it that has like the millennial <laughs> whoop and like there's yeah. images of like mountains and sunrises and shit 
the millennial this, sha la la la. Yeah, this, this is like what if the pumpkins did one of those songs? <laughs> so therefore, it's better than most of those, but it's still in that genre. Now yeah. I'm just picturing Billy Corgan throwing a lot of wells into his song. Oh, can you imagine? It'd be great. How I guess good that would be. I guess the quote unquote millennial whoop is wow. 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 But yeah, yeah, especially the drum production on this. Very much a millennial whoop kind of drum production. Millennial whoop. Mill- millennial whoop. Millennial whoop. As, as frickin- Hank Hill would call it. It's a, a millennial whoop. Octave to fifths. Whoa. That's a like. I think it's a third, isn't it? didn't invent fifths, yo. Yeah, they didn't invent it, but if it's used in a bunch of pop songs during a certain era and it's largely consumed by that single market, then it is worth noticing the trend. God damn it, Steve. Things have been it's done musically fifth. before. It's a third. But oh, when sorry, it's specifically third. produced in that same way with like the same kind of reverb production in the same kind of song, it is a and noticeable trend. And always sounds shitty. <laughs> Wait, is it, is it a third down or is it a... Because I was calling it octave to fifth. Uh, let me look up the article. You know what? No, we're going to waste too much time on it. It's this a third musical- no matter what. I don't know what the interval or I know what the interval is. I don't know what the uh where it starts or ends, but I know it's a third. But it's okay, like so it's, it, it's, it, it's, a, is- it's a musical trend worth commenting on. Like you know how 90s kids were like, "Wow, they do loud soft." You mean dynamics? Yes, dynamics <laughs> are always a thing, but you can comment on loud soft being a trend. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to remember. I think I think I think of it as a fifth because I think of it as from the octave below. So it's a fifth above that, which I think is technically incorrect if you want to take it all the way back to antiquity when things were like relative to each I'm, other. But we're using a fixed tuning, a fixed interval tuning, so it's the same thing. I'ma let you pick, Steve. You either can uh let go of the 90s being unique for loud soft remember that dynamics have always existed in music or so you you either let that go and also uh say millennial whoop isn't a thing or you acknowledge millennial whoop is a thing and get to keep loud soft you get to pick one of the two you know how much greg loves letting it go <laughs> <laughs> so much that he won't let it go right uh so wait the 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 idea is i can't grouse about Every grunge band using the exact same dynamics. If if you have, or I can't, you know, so, so refer. The thing is, to- you 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 can't um, ignore one musical trend and then embrace another and saying that this exists and this doesn't, and be grousing about people using you know terminology to describe a musical trend when those musical trends have always existed. Like, you know, loud soft Kiss did that, and I want you and rock and roll over. They did the, like, we're going to do this quiet part and then get really loud and then go to the quiet part and then get really loud. Like, so I'm saying you get to, you get to pick one. You get to pick I mean, consistency in your, in your, in your bullshit. Are we, are we <laughs> complaining about too many songs using the same woe? Yes. Yes. <sighs> in that case, I think I just hate the term. I think it needs a better name. I think uh, uh, I think the name is great because I also hate it. I hate the name, <laughs> and I hate the thing. I, th- I think the thing is great. I love woes and songs. Right, but I grew when up it's with the, pop punk. But when it's the same woe and the same type of song consumed by the same market, you know, as with the case with the grunge bands, where it's loud, soft, same type of song, same type of production, consumed by the same market. Look, Nirvana should have been replaced by Blink One Eighty Two, and every song since then should just sound like Blink One Eighty Two. I agree. Anyway, next up is a stitch in time. I want one, five, six, four, and whoa! Uh, a stitch in time. Next up on the list, I did call the top four, so go me. Uh, didn't call the order of the top four, but still, you know, correctly called which songs deserve to be at the top. Uh, so, Steve, you're the most wrong about this one, so why don't you go first? I'll put this one third from the bottom. The song's fine. Um... I think if I were to put a cutoff of songs that I wouldn't have included in the project, it would have been Awada on at third from the bottom on down. Uh, and this one is just above that cutoff, so it's fine. It's got some weak voice Billy problems, uh, but like, it's, it's not the worst. Uh, wait, what are we talking about? Stitch in Time? Yeah, Stitch in yeah. Time. Where, what notes am I reading? Okay, I was reading my Spangled Notes. Sorry, I'm very confused. 
I mean, still th same thing about putting it just above a, a water. Um, it's got a B-side vibe about it. Uh, it. Yeah, it's like, it does sound like, it, okay. <laughs> Continue I telling us why you're wrong and then we'll correct you when it's our turn. Okay, <laughs> okay. starting over. Uh, all right, so this one, I put it third, fourth from the bottom, just above Awada. Uh, it would be above the cutoff of what I would have removed from the project. Um, I don't think that it's a bad song. I think it's a weird song that doesn't really have a proper home. Uh, it sounds like it should be on a B-Sides collection. It sounds like it should be on a Pisces kind of thing rather than on a full album, uh, largely because it's like... it's Which it's apparently not. Right. <laughs> so it's, it sounds like it should be a single MP3 released a part of uh, a project that was incomplete. <sighs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but it's like, it's too, it's too acoustic to be like the rocker single that they would put out. Um, but it's too energetic to be the, like, the down acoustic song on the album. So... It's, it's just the sort of thing that, you know, I guess if you're trying to remove yourself from the context of albums, then the idea of something that would be orphaned and couldn't exist on one of their albums kind of makes sense. But I don't think it's really strong enough to stand on its own either. So you just end up with this awkward orphan song that doesn't belong anywhere. It's not that it, you know, is bad. It just doesn't have anywhere to go. All right, are you done with your wrong opinion so Victor and I can correctly <laughs> talk about the song? <laughs> I, I would like to hear Victor correct me first, Greg. All right, Victor, go I, ahead since you ranked it the highest. Uh, oh, I did. Interesting. Um, so I think this one, I will agree with one thing uh, Steve said, which is I would appreciate if either in the first or in the second chorus, everyone had come in and then there was like big electric guitar and like, full drums and stuff. I think it would be my number one if that had happened where it went full bore into being the energy it was. But I think the main thing that this gets points from me for is this vocal melody and kind of the conceit of the lyrics should annoy me and it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love the little synth riffs throughout. The synth riffs I think are they're all so really great. great. Yeah, no, they're uh, I, oh, so great. Yeah, so this song is really good. It should piss me off. And the fact that it does not and is, in fact, awesome makes it extra awesome that I can almost entirely overlook the one thing that I really wish it did. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy the vibe of this kind of song so much. I think that... Um, in some ways, I think in some ways Steve has a wider musical palette than I do, and then in other ways I think I have a wider musical palette than he does. And like, Steve, will I like my to... music in boxes, Greg. Uh, <laughs> what box does it go in? <laughs> right. Um, I, the thing is, because I listen to a lot more classic rock, and I'm just used to a lot more songs that have like this kind of in between acoustic and rocker vibe to it. I can appreciate the exact tempo it's going for. And I know that Billy, you know, has a lot, sorry, William, uh, has a lot of influences that are different than mine, but also shares a lot of my same influences. And so I can see where the kind of bands he appreciated he was emulating on this track. And I very much resonate with that as sharing those tastes. Uh, but, you know, as Victor mentioned, um, you know, that those keyboard lines are so great. I love the vocal hooks in this. Like, it's so stinking catchy. And lyrically, as someone who has, like, very much, like, dipped my toe into, like, weird occult bullshit and, um, like, you know, thinks that a lot of it is, um, you know, ridiculous and silly and was worried that the lyrics would be on the ridiculous and silly side of that kind of stuff, um... It's actually pretty clever and pretty consistently good when he gets into this kind of subject matter. And so I just fully dug every aspect of it. I dug the lyrics. I dug the melody, the instrumentation, the vibe, the tempo. Uh, I just sincerely loved this piece and think it's very excellent. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm super into it. I think it's great. 
And so, you know, I gave it 10 points. Victor gave it 11 points. I'm sorry, Steve. You're just wrong about this one. Just fucking wrong, bro. Speaking of things that Steve is wrong about, <laughs> Nest, Up, <laughs> Nest Up is a song I gave 12 points to and Victor gave 10 points to. We've got A Song for a Son next on the list. Uh, Steve, Steve didn't like this one? I put it in the middle. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, right. Steve, since you're the most wrong about this, why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, discussing what I'm going to be painting. Uh, was, like, I didn't hate this one. I put it in the middle. Um, it's a little vocal harm. Uh, okay, so this is this one where the it's big the thing opening is... Song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just it's the song that's in, it's it's for a son. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so this is what I was talking about earlier, where you can sort of hear it taking a while for the project to find its legs, uh, production-wise. In that, this song still has is way too vocal dominant, uh, much like the other stuff that WPC had been recording recently. Uh, and he sort of found his way back to a more guitar forward production style a couple songs into the project. And that really hinders this one in that the vocal hooks aren't as good as the guitar hooks in this song. I mean, you know that like and, it starts off with piano and vocals, right? Yeah, the synth hooks are also better than the vocal hooks. All of the instruments that have hooks are better at it than the vocals, but the vocals are the most dominant, which is to the song's detriment. It's a, it's a, it, the song has the potential, but you know, if it had been later in the project, it probably would have been much stronger for it. So your gripes are entirely uh, vocal forward, and that's it. Pretty much, yeah. And I'm gonna wait. For I wish, I wish your vocals were a little more forward <laughs> in whatever the hell's going on. In your yeah, house. me too. <laughs> Messing with my stove. Uh, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, as I said, it's not a bad song. It's a fine song. I put it in the middle of this decent set of songs because the production isn't where it should be. If the production was where it should be, it would probably be rated higher. I don't know why you guys are grousing about me for being wrong. All right, well, um, so I, Victor, do you want to go next or do you want me to go next? Um, just because it's an easy transition, I would agree that the production on the song is a little weird, but I think the song itself is so strong that it's difficult not to say it's one of the exemplary tracks, even though I would agree it would have been nice if there was just a little bit of tweaking on the mix or whatever needed to happen to make it sound more part of the rest of the album. But I think since it's first, it kind of works. Um, and yeah, I think this is a very good song. Uh, sailing without a map is a really bad idea. <laughs> and he he does it again in this song. Uh, this is a song for a tailor who stitched up My Old House. Yeah, uh, I rent this number one because uh, as you're griping about the production, this is the one that has the maybe closest to classic rock production in the entire Pumpkins catalog. So it's like, whoa, this song sounds like music that I like. That's super neat. Um, but just, I love the way that everything is mixed together where it's, you know, a much more, you know, maybe dated production. Sounds like something from the 60s or 70s, which for me is a cool thing. And I think the songwriting is so sinking, stinking strong. Where I, I disagree that, um, I agree and I disagree. I think the all the instrument hooks are great, but I don't think that the vocal hooks are so much weaker Um that having the vocals forward hurts the song. I think the vocal performance is great. I think the vocal hooks are great. I think the lyrics are genius, and is this is one of Billy's best lyrical pieces. I love the sincerity of the piece. Um, the guitar playing is maybe uh, the best in the catalog um, in terms of like, the solos and stuff. Like This might be my favorite collection of guitar solos that the Pumpkins have ever done. Um, so all these things combined just make for just a really, really excellent masterpiece of a song that I adore. And I can understand um, 
why the song that won the ranking won and why this one didn't. But I think this is an exemplary song, something to be proud of, and something that blew me away right away when starting to listen to this album because I heard nothing but bad things about it. And I'm just like, oh, so Pumpkins fans are just one-dimensional and can't understand, like, if Billy does something different. Got it. Like, this is great. <laughs> this is really freaking great. Yeah. That's my thoughts good. on that. <laughs> Um, oh, this is one thing I have in here that um, I noted. Billy is a very expressive guitar player. I've said this at least once in every album note section I've ever written, but I've never actually said it out loud. And it's something that I really appreciate in every single one of these albums that I've done that he was involved with. And I just never said it out loud. I very much admire when he's playing a solo. Yeah, I mean, this is very you know, exemplary guitar playing from Billy Corgan, the kind of stuff where actually, uh, I'll tell you this, on uh, on my YouTube channel, there's a, there's a kid who's been commenting, uh, and he's been talking about how he's not really into the Smashing Pumpkins, and I sent him that song, I said, hey, check this one out. And he's like, wow, that was really, really great. I didn't think I would like the Smashing Pumpkins, because he's into, like, Allman Brothers and classic rock stuff. So I turned him out of that, and he thought it was a really awesome song, and it's going to check out more of the band. Mm-hmm. The Almond the Almond Brothers. Like if they're all brothers, no shit, they're all men. <laughs> <laughs> so any other comments so, on oh go ahead. To to con- to continue with my earlier thoughts, it may not even necessarily be like the I'm not necessarily poo-pooing all the vocal hooks on this one, but there are times when the guitar and synth hooks are much stronger than the vocal hooks. And there are times when the vocal hooks get a little mediocre like the like the the really dramatic sail without a map part i'm just like it's just like, <laughs> like it's not a good dramatic delivery it's just kind of cheesy uh, it works you know, for me but also i like a lot of cheesy shit so i like a lot of cheesy shit but like this isn't self-aware cheesy it's just like oops we accidentally made something kind of cheesy I mean, look, I like, a lot of, I like a lot of cheesy oops, shit. Oops, all cheese. Self-aware. Actually, I'm... Where can I get some oops, all cheese? Dude, I listen to Kiss. <laughs> I love cheesy shit that isn't self-aware. That makes it better. <laughs> That's fair. That is what, That is probably a good capsule statement of uh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the major ways we differ in our musical taste. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, would it have been better if he had gone, and sales without a map? Just like do his do his best Michael Stipe imitation. Uh, do his best old timey uh, like crooner. <laughs> so I think I think the difference between myself and Steve musically is that he likes when stuff is cheesy on purpose, and I like when stuff is cheesy on accident. And we both find it hilarious. Like, haha, look at them making this joke. And so I think it's more fun. Like, oh, they didn't realize what they were doing. How can a human not realize that? That is so hilarious. And Steve's just like, oh, man, I love that they made this joke. Aren't they clever? So, yeah, we found out our difference, Steve. Two sides of the same <laughs> coin, you and I. Difference. Our one Everything. difference. The one thing we disagree on. Everything else we agree on, but that's just the core of all of our disputes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next up on the list is uh, the song that I ranked number two in the ranking. So in the correct spot, we've got Astro Planes. Next on the list. All right. So yeah, Victor, you ranked um, the yeah, lowest, I like it a lot. but... I mean, you still ranked it pretty yeah. high, so this is. I think we all are in a consensus. This is a pretty good song. Yeah. I, I well, and I had it higher until I realized how badass it would be if I put Tear Garden Theme Forty Five over it just to fuck around. <laughs> <laughs> um, and wasn't that badass that I did that? <laughs> it was so badass, dude. <laughs> it was so badass when I just sort of messed with numbers. Um. I really appreciate (laughs) the weird scale he's using here. And in my notes, I say, I'll hopefully take a minute to pick it out before the recording so I can sound smart when I know what it is, (laughs) which I did not do. You only had three weeks. I know. 
Um, and I also specifically mentioned that the bridge is good. So you know this song is strong. Wait, which part do you think is the bridge? The good part. Is that the I agree. Far away line. Far yeah, away line. Okay, That's yeah, a good bridge. I, I wrote in my notes that I like the contrast in mode between the the bridge and the <laughs> verse. Because <laughs> I wasn't entirely sure what that part was supposed to be. This was just based on my instincts and not so much on me actually going through and diagramming the song. Because if I had done that, then I would have also picked out the scale and sounded really smart when I nailed it. <laughs> Maybe the trick is that part is actually a chorus, and that's why you thought it was okay. Oh. It, it, it's a chorus that happens once? <laughs> Does it only happen once? I thought it happens twice. Mm. Maybe we should listen to this album again. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, and this is also the song where I noted that my man's traded in his hundreds of reverb plugins for several phases and flangers. <laughs> my man. My man's, man's the with brain. an S. <laughs> my man's muscles commands the brain to follow <laughs> orders coming down from headquarters. When are we going to do the Might Be Giants album, Greg? I don't know. It's it'll At some point, maybe, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> what one would you want to do, Steve? I actually have no idea. I feel like make Flood car. is the obvious choice, but I don't actually... Oh, yeah, Mink Car. I like Mink Car. And by Mink Car, I mean it's a great troll album in that I think it's got some really amazing songs, and the fan base in general is like, what Mink Car? Ugh, I hate that one. It's not Flood. It doesn't sound like all the other stuff they've done, and I can't accept when the band I like grows and evolves and changes. <laughs> Which, for a band like They Might Be Giants, is just, like, the most ludicrous stance to have. Uh, dude, I think the one thing that I've learned through my, you know, doing music critiques uh, through the course of this podcast and my YouTube channel is that... Like, people are way too stuck on just, like, one era of a band that they like. And it's, oh, yeah. it gets old super fast. Like, I mean, there'll be bands where, you know, they'll diversify their catalog and there'll be a lot of stuff I don't like. But I always respect them for giving them a shot and doing it. Uh, that's why I'm a good REM advocate, because I think uh, all of their albums are good except for one. I mean, that's, yeah, that's... And, you know, I'm a good Kiss advocate because I like all of their albums and think, you know, there's a couple of them just like, oh, why did you do Jago Kuretsa to you guys? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for the most part, I find stuff to appreciate on every release. Like, even if it's not like I don't love it as much as some of their other stuff, I at least, like, get what they were going for and at least have a couple songs I'm like, yeah, this is great. Man, I knew we should have done the new Enter Shikari album. But uh, anyway... I think the song That was a is, really esoteric joke that, like, nobody outside of my head was going to get. Yeah, well, you know, I, I appreciate the... I, hey, I, I remember you have the t-shirt of the guys, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I... They, I, uh, they put out a new album. So, like, they have diversified their sound a lot. Like, their first album, they mostly wrote when they were teenagers. And then uh, they, like, changed their sound up a lot. They di drifted away from the metal. They drifted more into dub for a long time then they like took a pretty hard swing for pop and then their most recent album they were like this is more like a career retrospective kind of album if you need the intro to enter shikari this is the one to go with so you know if at any point you're like i liked when they sounded like this but not the rest of the time apparently that's you know what you should be listening to sort of their meet the beatles <laughs> what Except, you know, except <laughs> they've been around for longer than the Beatles. Well, Meet the Beatles was the band's second album. Yeah, a very good introduction. I mean, oh yeah. I, it's, I, an invi it's a specific invitation. Got it. I thought, I thought in terms of like, we're going back to The instructions are right there on the label, Greg. It should our, start to follow. I thought you were talking about <laughs> going back to their roots with their classic sound, like an album and like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that makes sense. Anyway, Astral Plains, it's a good song. Uh, I like the lyrics. I like the music a lot. I think it's just a really excellent piece. I think it's um, it does a good job of capturing like a spacey atmosphere while also being catchy, still sound like the pumpkins, having great hooks, sucking you in. Um, and I think in terms sucking of like you off, uh, what <laughs> sucking you off, sucking you in, 
sucking you off. Right. Suck, um, you know, just all kinds of sucking. But <laughs> but good. But good. Uh, no, th- this song just – it's really great in that it's, it helps further the concept of what Tear Garden was trying to do very well. And so when you listen to it back-to-back with um, A Song for a Son – it really keeps that momentum going, makes you interested in the project and where it's going to end up, and makes it a little bit of a bummer that it wasn't finished. But I think this is a really great song, and it's a great one-two punch. I remember seeing the announcement of this project and was like, mm, this might be doomed. Because he wrote all the songs before he even started, and I was like, I don't think he wrote 50 good songs in a you know, one-month, two-month period. And Because you forgot he- how melancholy worked. And even if he did, well, I mean, I don't think he wrote 50 good songs in a row in a one to two month period. And even if he did, I don't think he's going to be able to just sit on those 50 songs and be like, yeah, I'm really working on these and not eventually get bored and be like, yeah, but I wrote new songs. I want to work on those now. And you were right. To start. <laughs> oh, weird. Weird that, that <laughs> thing that I guessed happened. <laughs> But yeah, this song's great. Yeah. Any other comments on Astro Planes before we move on to the number one song in the ranking? I do like that Victor was all concerned that he wouldn't sound smart by being able to name like what was going on with keys. And then Greg was just like, I think the music's good. <laughs> I mean, we've been going on for, for a while. Thanks for not showing up. Thanks for not showing up, our friend Greg. <laughs> I appreciate this. <laughs> I'm very fragile. <laughs> I mean, it's been going on for a while, and it took me a long time to get to interject into the long commentary about uh, they might be giants and uh, enter Shikari. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the music's good. Anyway. In, in summary, I'd like to do I Like Fun. That's fair. It's a good one. Is it working for you? <laughs> All right, going through the list from the bottom to the top. Nips, Cottonwood Symphony, Widow Wake My Mind, Owada, Spangled, Tear Garden Theme, Lightning Strikes, Freak USA, Tom Tom, A Stitch in Time, A Song for a Son, Astro Planes, but the best song on Tear Garden by Kaleidoscope, according to this panel of experts, and Steve. Wait, it's hold up. The Fellowship. Hold up. Yeah. Really? We, we picked The Fellowship as the number one song? Yes. The one that I was like, this isn't technically the best vocal hooks on this album, but man, do I love those synths. Everybody else <laughs> agreed with me that this is the best song on the album? This panel yeah, of uh, this panel of three, uh, you gave it 12 points, Victor gave it 12 points, I gave it 9 points. So I called the top oh, yeah, four, Victor. but um, I put this... So I think this is a very good song, but I don't think it's the number one song on the album in terms of well, just clearly hooks you're wrong, Greg. In terms of hooks and writing, I don't think it's the strongest song. But I think that this is the most um the best uh angsty, like smashing pumpkin song on this album. So just like here's Billy Corgan being angry, singing about revolution with some, you know, crunchy guitars and some synths in the background. So for the Pumpkins fans who are just like, man, Billy's been too happy lately. I want him to be pissed off. I, <laughs> here you go. Uh, here is uh, him doing that very well. And so I'm not surprised it won the ranking. And I think it was, um, you know, one of the strongest songs on the album. I think it was um, you know, the strongest song on the EP that it came off of. Uh, but I just thought the first EP was stronger overall than it. But I think it's still a good song. Greg, I think you're missing a key detail about this song that uh, Victor the, and I are aware of. The vocals is are that buried? There are, only, there are only two positions on this song, Greg. Yeah. You're either with us, with us or you're against or us. Against us. Tonight. Tonight. All right. It's all right. Hashtag radical It's all right. right. <laughs> Fucking radical centrists. <laughs> 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 All right, you got us this time, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this song is about Final Fantasy VII also. Uh, but it's in the style of Mega Man, but it's also Temporary Secretary, but it's also Every Time We Touch. <laughs> Shoot, wow. I should have ranked it higher. <laughs> And I can handle lyrics if they're stupid if the song goes this hard. <laughs> <laughs> and this song goes fucking hard. 
<laughs> Which is good because the lyrics are this stupid. Yeah, they are that stupid. <laughs> but yeah, Greg, I mean, this train this they, train ain't going to stop. Are they really any more stupid than like the average angsty pumpkin song? I don't know. I've only listened to their late period stuff. <laughs> the answer is no, Victor. The answer is no. <laughs> I think just the difference is that um, the Pumpkins albums that Pumpkins fans have nostalgia for because they came out during their formative life years, they're more willing to give a pass to bullshit lyrics. To offset their bullshit, you know, personalities. <laughs> Anyway, Steve, like, uh, you want I'm to a teenager. Billy Corgan being mean to Courtney Love is cool. <laughs> I'm a I don't teenager. Know that he's ever mean to Courtney being Love. mean to women is cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, Steve, you liked this one? Yeah, it's pretty good. It's um, it's not their strongest offering overall, and there's definitely some moments that I'm like, eh, I don't care, and I don't usually go back to it for repeated listens, but like. I'm glad this project existed and it got some good songs out of it that are not on Spotify. He figured out the just give away your music for free and hope that works out strategy and then proceeded to ignore it. <laughs> Sad. He was against us after all. <laughs> Apparently he was. And so I guess we're in the, uh, the wrap up thoughts now. So, um, overall thoughts on this quote unquote album? Well, I thought we were already at that part, so I just did that. Well, it was Victor's <laughs> turn. Um, I can't see where you're pointing, Greg. Your hand is in your house. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's in your heart. That's, uh, that's a little. Our hearts in our hands, and our hands in our houses. That's a our... little heart house joke for you. <laughs> thing my favorite genre <laughs> happens happens to me again on this album even though i knew it was coming um i think this album is very strong i hmm, i would have to listen to zwan again because i liked that album a lot too but i think this is at least making a run for the strongest album uh billy corgan related album that i've heard for this show um which I maybe didn't uh, perfectly exemplify in some of my comments, but I think this album is honestly really good. Why do you think and so many fans hate it and say it's a giant pile of trash? Because it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I like I don't know how to state it any more plainly than that. Uh, it doesn't sound like what I assume the pumpkins would sound like, and I can see why they wouldn't like that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have. It doesn't really have a zero. I think a song for a son is better than zero. Yeah, but your taste is bad. You don't. That, I don't even remember if you liked zero. I do like zero. I think it's a great song. Mm. I should have said bullet then. It also <laughs> doesn't have a bullet with butterfly wings. Oh, yeah, it doesn't it does. have their biggest signature song. You know what doesn't have their biggest signature song? Almost every album except Melancholy. <laughs> Did you know that Adore doesn't have a bullet with butterfly wings? That's true. Did you know that Machina doesn't have a bullet with butterfly wings? Did you know that Siamese Dream doesn't have a bullet with butterfly wings? Like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah, but Machina has, you know, uh, um, why am I spacing on the name of it? It has Stand Everlasting Inside Your Love. Days. Sorry? And this, it has Stand Inside Your Love, and this has a song for a son. I think this is. The best songs on this album, I think, are competitive with the best songs on any other Pumpkins album. Yeah, but you don't like the super heavy pumpkin songs, is the thing. Is like you generally don't like the things like Bullet with Butterfly Wings. You don't like any of Gish. And, and you know Is Gish the, really the heavy or just pumpkins. not catchy? I mean and also I like some of their heavier songs like God. Uh, and uh, Aeroplane Flies High. So it's not that I'm against all their heavier songs, it's just, you know, some of their more mainstream songs I just don't care for. I mean, I, I acknowledge I'm a weirder Pumpkins fan in that there's a couple of their signature songs that I'm just not hot on, but I feel like at this point, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins are one of my favorite bands, probably top 20, I've invested a lot of time into listening to them, and I feel like I do have some valid stances on the band at this point. But I think 
your your stance of not understanding why fans don't like it. No, I, I don't. I understand because they're closed minded and want everything to sound like bullet. I don't think they want everything to sound like bullet. They want there to be a bullet, though. They want there to be a bullet. They want there to be a zero. You know, they want there to be uh, uh, a Hummer and a, a mayonnaise. But I, on this this, album. And, but I feel like Freak USA is, you know, a very old school retro pumpkin song. I think the Fellowship, old school retro pumpkin song, like Fellowship, is so fundamentally different from an old school retro song. Okay, like, well, it has sense. That Aside kind of sense. deep blues. Yeah, on the sense of what make or break the song. And a lot of their, a lot of the songs that Pumpkins fans like came out. Uh, before Final Fantasy VII, so uh, there's true. no way he could have written this song before then. That's true. That, I think that's... When you look at, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins through a post-Final Fantasy VII lens, all of a sudden it all <laughs> sort of makes more sense as to why they got so much better after that game came out. <laughs> so Victor does bring up a really excellent point there. Because all of their post-FF7 that's why material, you have me on these shows. minus Machina 2, has been, you know, pretty much home runs out of the park. <laughs> Indeed, but no, I I I get your point. The song, the this album maybe doesn't have the strong, heavy, angsty pumpkin single, and I guess in my mind that was never the part of the band that sold me on them. Right. And I think that a lot of people were sold on the band because of that. They were sold bull with butterfly wings. And then they got the rest of Melon Cow and like, oh, most of this is not bullet with butterfly wings, but. In their mind, but I listened for Bullet and uh, you know caught on to the greatness of the rest of it. Right, and when the band decides not to put a bullet on an album, they're like, "Oh, this has all the other sides of melancholy without the bullet," and so therefore, I think it's trash. Um, which to me, I still find to be very close-minded musically. Uh, as someone, you know, you've you've heard the Kiss discography at this point, where I'm like, yeah, yeah, Elder and Carnival of Souls and Crazy Nights, get weird with it, do something different. Like I encourage doing yeah, something imagine different. Imagine how much and got people bored with Sonic hated, Boom. Imagine how much people would have hated Elder if it didn't have I. Like you take out the one arena song, rock song. You think people hate that one now? I mean, I, well, I think the other thing is like this. Al this is this album is objectively not done, so it's difficult to say whether perhaps a bullet would have showed up later. Oh, um, maybe. And yeah, I think if I do have a major complaint about this album is that the first couple of tracks, I think to your a point you were making earlier, is they do sound a little bit different, and then the further you get in, the more cohesive they all sound, even if yeah, the songs are varying quality throughout. I, I think the at least the production style eventually got sort of a foothold that made a lot of sense. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll, and, I'll say this in, in regards to that. Remember that these were separate EPs, so perhaps EP2 has a different sound than EP1, because I think there's two different sounds that the, these collections have, and I think the first EP does kind of have a consistent sound that's a little bit more spacey. Like, A Song First on Astral Plane, Stitch and Time all fit together very well, in my opinion. No, you can you can hear the production evolve throughout the course of even the first EP. Because yeah, wasn't it like they did one song for they did one song at a time? Yeah. So that it makes sense to me that eventually doing that process, they would be like, "All right, and here are the kinds of things we're going to do consistently," right. and they just didn't have that down yet for right. the first couple. The, the flow wasn't there yet. And the, so another question, these songs were that we listened to, they were in order of release. I uh, listened yes. to them mostly in order of release. Okay. So uh, it, I don't know what the is sound. in order of release. Okay. And like in the order that they made them too. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think that line of thinking at least works for me. I, I feel like it tracks based on how I remember the album sounding and like, there was supposed to be, what, almost 40 more songs? So it's, uh, you know, yeah. it's t completely possible that, like, there was going to be stuff that was reminiscent. Although, based on what we're hearing here, it's also very possible that 
there was not going to be anything like that. Right. I, I think, uh, you know, Steve made a great point about um, people maybe hating the Elder even more if there wasn't an I. But, I mean, I'm, in Kiss circles, that album is actually, you know, kind of universally derided. Um, right. And, and, you know, they didn't even get to the I on the album. And even I, I've heard a lot of people complain, like, oh, this song is just so dumb lyrically compared to their other songs. And I'm like, ah, oh, Kiss fans are so fucking stupid. <laughs> I mean, they are. <laughs> uh, but I think just like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I enjoy bands growing and evolving. I enjoy bands taking on different sounds. Like, Temporary Secretary doesn't sound anything like other McCartney songs before it. And it's a masterpiece. So, I don't know. Get weird with it. That's my thoughts. I think, you know, this goes back to, like, what came up on that Salvo episode is that, you know, you got to... Like, oh, you mean the ones where uh, where Dan uh, and Adam agreed with me and I was right? Right. Uh, I remember but, that. Like, that was great. <laughs> Tell me more about how you're wrong. But you can't... Sh you can very rarely shift too far all at once without, you know, you start to alienate your fans because they expect something. And if you don't have a bridge to what you're doing, what you want to do and what they expect you're going to have a bunch of disappointed fans. I mean, so you could think of like all of the albums up to this point as being that bridge, I guess, but I don't think that's going to be a satisfying answer for disappointed I, Smash. Plus Pumpkins also fans. a lot of, a lot of pumpkins fans were not satisfied with that bridge. Right, right. Like all the complaints about Zeitgeist being like, oh, this album sucks. It sounds like, you know, just angsty pumpkins, but the songs aren't good. Like, I feel like, you know, Billy was in a no-win situation with, uh, you know, people complaining about Zeitgeist, people complaining about Future Embrace, and just been like, you know what, I'm just going to write good songs. And you could put basically all of these on Melancholy and they would fit. Yeah. Well, you get into the problem of just, like, people's taste tends to solidify. And once that happens, even their favorite bands are going to have trouble impressing them anymore. Uh, like... You know, Corrigan is in a no-win situation that way. Like, he's, he's, like, a lot of his fan base is fiercely loyal, but, uh, like, They're a lot of his loyal fan to, like, base. Four albums. Yeah. And it, well, yeah, so you get the thing is, like, as you age, your taste tends to solidify that, like, most people don't, like, really discover new music after the age of 30 or so. And so as a fan base ages, if you try to, the more you try to experiment, unless you're somebody who's established very early in your career, that's what your fan base expects of you. Like uh, they might be giants or a ween or something like that. Your fan base is, you're going to lose your fan base on that kind of thing. But I thought he established that early on with just freaking Melancholy and Adore. Like those two albums... I I feel are very experimental when you have on the same album bullet with butterfly wings with, we only come out at night, you know, and the fact that there, it's not like it was just like one or two songs, a good, like half of melancholy were those weird eccentric songs. It's like, true. I think he tried to do that. And I think it didn't stick. I think he ended up in the same sort of situation that Axl Rose did where like he wanted to be a much grander, more interesting project than their first brilliant album sold them as. And uh, the fan base didn't want to go on that journey. Uh, well, Billy, I'm sorry that your fans suck, but uh, this is a great album. <laughs> That's our episode. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Victor, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, they can find me on Twitter, at the Fantastic K, and you can find my music which is uh, experimental and goes all sorts of places early on in my career uh, <laughs> at, under the name James Game Boy on Spotify and Patreon and Bandcamp. And Steve, where can people find us online, including our first album, which sold ourselves as a simplistic hard rock band, and our second album, which was boldly experimental and then was derided by fans and critics alike? Uh, they can find us on LipstickGeneration.com and lipstick generation on most social media platforms, or they could just come to my house and help me paint trim if they want to. And that is our episode. That is Bye, not Internet. a euphemism. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to the Lipstick Panel, hosted by Lipstick Generation. Lipstick Generation's music can be found on all major streaming platforms and at LipstickGeneration.com. If you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know your ranking of the subject in the comments down below. Feel free to leave us an episode suggestion also. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, please leave a review and tell a friend about our show. Thanks and rock on! <laughs>